And now it's time for our study for today. Our speaker, as always, is Chris McCann. And the title of his study will be Isaiah 24, Part 12. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship's online gathering of believers that as we gather together with the Word of God. And today we'll be looking at Isaiah chapter 24. Let's turn to Isaiah 24 and read, beginning in verse 12. In the city is left desolation, and the gate is smitten with destruction. When thus it shall be in the midst of the land, among the people, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree, and as the gleaning grapes when the vintage is done. They shall lift up their voice. They shall sing for the majesty of Jehovah. They shall cry aloud from the sea. Wherefore glorify ye Jehovah in the fires, even the name of Jehovah, God of Israel, in the isles of the sea. And I'll stop reading there. Now in our last study in the book of uh, Isaiah and in chapter 24, We were looking at verse 12 and discussing the first part of the verse, then the city is left desolation. And we saw how the Bible uses that idea of desolate or desolation in a spiritual sense to indicate that God is no longer present. It's why when the churches and congregations became a spiritual wasteland, a desolation. Remember, um, the abomination of desolation was standing in the holy place, as we read in Matthew 24. And that is because the Holy Spirit abandoned the churches and left them. And so this phrase that the church becomes desolate and also at times it's added without an inhabitant, is indicative of the removal of the Holy Spirit. God has departed. He has left and given up his people, if it's concerning the church. Now, in the case of Isaiah 24, the context is not the church, but it is the earth, the whole world and all the inhabitants of the earth. And we've seen that in verse after verse after verse. But um, we've discussed that, so now we're going to move on to the next part of the verse. And the gate is smitten with destruction. And the gate um, has to do with the doorway to heaven. For instance, we, we read in Genesis 28, verse 17, this verse and he was afraid and said how dreadful is this place this is none other but the house of god and this is the gate of heaven now that's jacob who's speaking as as god came to visit him in that particular spot and that would become bethel and bethel means the house of god and Notice this is the gate of heaven, and it is said in association with the house of God, because the the gate, as the Bible speaks of it, is referring to the entry, the portal, the opening from this world into the kingdom of God, heaven itself, and and God established in the Old Testament Israel and in the New Testament, the church, to be this house of God, the representatives of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the kingdom of God. And and so the gateway was when God's caretakers of the gospel who um, were given commission to safeguard it and to be faithful to it. And in the New Testament, the added commission was to carry it forth, to bring it into all the world that everyone might hear. Um, This house of God became 
the gate to heaven as people were drawn into the churches and congregations and listened to the Bible being read, the Bible being preached. They could receive the grace of God as God granted them grace and saved individuals. That was the process that God established for the church age. But he also established a time of uh, sending forth the gospel after the church age came to an end, and this was the latter reign. And he sent the gospel into the world in a glorious way, in an unparalleled way. There has never been a time, as we have just witnessed, when the gospel went forth to the degree that it did just prior to May 21, and every place the gospel went. It had the ability, the Word of God has this ability, to minister open doors, to open up a door of faith into heaven. And God did this all over the earth as he saved the great multitude. Now, the the word gate is also found in Psalm 118, and we'll read verses 19 and 20. Open to me the gates of righteousness. I will go into them, and I will praise Jehovah, this gate of Jehovah, into which the righteous shall enter. And notice it's it's the righteous who enter in. And, of course, the Bible uh, reveals to us that none is righteous, no, not one. And if we were left to ourselves, then that would mean none of us could enter into the gates of heaven. We we would be left out. But God developed a, a glorious and wonderful program of the Lord Jesus Christ, paying for the sins of his elect people and granting them his righteousness. The word of God says, by the obedience of one were many made righteous. And that is the obedience of Christ as he gave up his very life for the sake of doing the Father's will and paying for the sins of the whole company of the elect. Now, the New Testament also uh, has things to say about the gateway that leads to heaven. In Matthew chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, these are familiar verses. It says there, enter ye in, At the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat, because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There is the fact that salvation is not for everyone. Salvation is isn't for each human being as as some mistakenly think because they misread a verse like John 3:16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son and they fail to carefully look at that verse and and also to carefully look at everything else the bible says and certainly from this verse alone we see that um wide And broad, the wide gate and broad way leads to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. That that is very clear language, that many, many people will be destroyed. And on the other hand, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way, which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it because the elect are few. It's a remnant out of the whole. It is a great multitude or a tremendous sum um, looked at by itself. For instance, in all probability, 200 million people are the number that the Bible gives that God saved. And yet, what is 200 million out of a world of 7 billion and, and all the previous billions that have lived and died upon the earth. It it is a, a, a very small number in comparison. Yet 
of itself, it, it is a, a, a tremendous multitude. And God indicates that we could learn just from these verses that there will be gospels, there will be religions, and and many professed Christians that will say, well, we can get you to heaven, and here's what you have to do. Here's the road you follow. And it will be fairly easy to travel down that road because a, a wide gate is easy to enter in. A broad way is easy to travel. On the other hand, a straight gate is not easy. And uh, a narrow way is also not easy to go on. And when we read the Bible, we learn just how narrow this way is. It It is such a narrow way and such a straight gate that it is actually impossible for a man to squeeze through based on anything he does in his life. No one can enter into the kingdom of God because of anything they've ever done or ever could do, any good work, any act of righteousness, any alms, any mercy that they've shown. Nothing can uh, can lead a person to safely enter into that portal and into the doorway that leads to eternal life. No, it's only the Lord Jesus Christ who can bring his people through. Well, uh, over in Luke 13, we have a very similar verse to Matthew 7, but it is also different. It says in Luke 13, verse 24, Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Now, this sounds similar to Matthew 7 and verses 13 and 14, but it's not saying the same thing at all. It does mention the straight gate, but notice in verse 24 of Luke 13, it is stating that the many are not trying to go the broad way, as we read previously in the other, in the other gospel account, they are trying to go the narrow way. They're trying to enter in the straight gate. They're seeking to go in, in other words, the proper way. Now, that is very unusual. It is not the same statement that Matthew 7 made. And why is this? Well, it continues in verse 25, when once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door, and ye begin to stand without, and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not when she are. Now, this is giving us additional information, and that is that Luke 13 and, and verse 24 and following is not speaking of the normal period of time over the course of history, for instance, during the church age or even during the latter reign. It's not speaking of that period of time, but it's speaking of the particular period of time in which the master of the house, who can only be God, has risen and has shut to the door. Now the whole dynamic changes and the many are not said to be going the broad way, but they're trying to go the straight way, the straight gate. And that's the gate that the elect went through. Yet we also read, they shall not be able. Now when we read that many will go the broad way in uh, Matthew 7, that was language that was indicating an ongoing situation. We know that because we, we've seen it all of our lives. 
where people are trying to get right with God. They they know deep down they're in trouble with him, and so they identify somehow with him through some religion or some type of gospel. And it's a gospel they can manipulate. It's a gospel where they can control their own salvation. And it's an ongoing process that's been in practice throughout the history of the world. Many have sought the wide gate and the broad way, and for the most part, unknowingly, it has led to their destruction. That is, those individuals didn't know, many of them, that the gospel they were holding on to could not save because they added works or the religion they believed. And so they lived and died, uh, perhaps even comfortably, thinking that they would go to heaven, and yet they did not, they, they ceased to be. They, they were destroyed. And that is the common practice throughout mankind's history in this world. But when the master of the house is risen up, now it also says many are seeking, but it says they're seeking the straight gate. Now, since the previously when many sought to go the Broadway, we knew that was happening in time over the course really of years and years and years. So why would we think differently concerning these verses when many are seeking to go to straight gate? And they also are are um if, if we read on here, let me let me continue. Uh, well, I already read verse twenty five. They're standing without knocking at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say unto you, I know you not whence ye are. That is, there is some sort of problem here. They're not able to enter into the door. There's a dispute that they are making. They think they should be able. They're insisting they should be let in. And and God is saying, no, the door is shut. He has shut to the door. And now there's a complete inability to open the door. Now, isn't this striking, really, as we consider our present circumstances, as we consider what we have learned from the Bible? And remember, the big news prior to May 21, was that that would be the day. May 21, not May 20th or May 22nd, but May 21 would be the day, 7,000 years after the flood, exactly, or, or the equivalent according to the Bible, when God shut the door to the ark. As we read in Genesis chapter 7, and I'll I'll just read one verse in verse 16. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded him, and Jehovah shut him in. And God gives us the date that he shut them in. It was the time when they uh, were were sealed safely into the ark, and it was the time when the flood would begin and the world would be destroyed by water. And it was the 17th day of the second month. And it so happens that May 21 of 2011, unlike any year in a 20-year period, that particular date in the Hebrew calendar happened to be the 17th day of the second month. And it happened to be the year that was 7,000 years from 4990 B.C. when the flood occurred. And it also happened to be, May 21, 2011, the exact, to the very day, 23rd full and complete year of the Great Tribulation, the 8400th day. So the Great Tribulation came to an end on that day. 7,000 years from the flood, and on that day, marked on the Hebrew calendar, 
was the very day that God shut the door on the ark. And again, guaranteeing the safety of all within and guaranteeing the destruction of all without. That was the day that God gave us advance information concerning it and he moved in his people to broadcast this news to all the earth to let everyone know and and this happened for a period of years leading up to that date to let everyone know from the time you hear this you have from that point up until may 21 when the door will shut the door to heaven the gateway to the kingdom of god will close that was really the big news it wasn't the physical worldwide earthquake that we had uh, misunderstood it wasn't ever that that what is a physical earthquake in comparison to the end of salvation to the closing of the door to heaven. There is no comparison. And so God had this news trumpeted. He had this news reported to all the nations of the world. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. While it was the day of salvation. Some people wrongly misapply that phrase. They think because the sun has come up, it's the day of salvation. Oh, no. We have to let the Bible define that as well as everything else. And the day of salvation is defined as that period of the latter rain. And and also, it's defined by the parable of the workers that that go into the, to the um, I think it's a vineyard in the Gospel of Matthew. And they work for 12 hours. And, and at the end of the 12th hour, it ends the day. Then the night comes. And the night comes when no man can work. And we have ended the day, the day of salvation. And now no man can work in getting the gospel out. Well, yes, we can and we, we should continue to share truth to teach truth like we're doing here or an individual believer with another believer or we can put it on a website we can broadcast it on the radio we can um, share a literature that teaches truth but we are not to share the gospel with the desire or expectation that the sharing of this gospel is like sowing seed in which God will bless it and individuals will become saved. No, that's done. We we may pray for people, oh Lord, could it be that you did save this one or you did save that one? And we can pray that the cup might pass from off anyone. So we can pray just like before, pouring out our hearts. But we pray knowing, not our will, but thine will be done. And God has revealed his will to us, and we are to understand that will and to follow it and to get ourselves in line with God's purpose for these days after the Great Tribulation. Well, let's go back to Isaiah 24, and it says the gate is smitten with destruction. The word smitten is translated in another place in second kings 18:4 uh differently and let's let's read that it says in second kings chapter 18 verse 4 he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces that's the word smitten those three english words that's the Hebrew word translated as smitten, and here translated as break in pieces, the brazen serpent that Moses had made. So that serpent was ordered to be made by God. God told Moses to make it. And then the Israelites who were bitten by serpents were to look upon it, and they could be healed. So that there was nothing wrong with that brazen serpent. 
except the Israelites began to turn it into an idol. And, and so God decreed that it was to be broken in pieces. It wasn't anything in itself anyway. It was just some image of a serpent. It was just something that God used once again to typify the Lord Jesus Christ. And likewise, um, the, the, gate, the gate to heaven, of course, has never been literal. It's never been physical. It's, it's just um, a, a way of speaking. God um, knows that we're very limited, finite creatures, and we think in terms of this earth. And and we understand doors, and we understand gates. You you open a door, you enter in, you close a door, and you're in a house or or wherever you entered into, and and so now he's he's giving us a very helpful illustration to let us know about the gate of heaven. The gate is smitten or broken to pieces with destruction. The judgment of God is upon the earth. And just as God closed the door to the churches back in 1988, he never opened it again. He, he never uh, saved anyone in the churches and congregations through the witness of, of the churches. And likewise, now he has done the same thing. The word destruction is only found here. Um, it's from another Hebrew word that is translated as as um, waste, I think, in Isaiah 6.11. So it, again, is pointing to that which is desolate. And, and uh, it, it's a further emphasis. Uh, again and again, with each verse we're reading in this chapter, it is driving the same point home. We cannot ignore it. We cannot dismiss it. We maybe would want it not to be this way, but this is the way it is. And certainly none in the churches wanted the end of the church age, but that was God's plan. And, and either we accept his will and we humble ourselves towards his plan and his perfect will, or we will eventually, if we're not already, wind up fighting against him. And that is never a good thing, and it is never uh, something a child of God wants to do. Well, let's move on into verse 13 of Isaiah 24. When thus it shall be in the midst of the land... The word land here is the same word that has been translated as earth so many times in this chapter, and that's how we should read it. When thus it shall be in the midst of the earth among the people. What, what does that mean, when thus it shall be in the midst of the earth among the people? Well, it's referring to all the previous statements, everything that God has been saying up until this point. Uh, for instance, going back... We won't even go back to the beginning of the chapter, but go back to verse 7. The new wine mourneth, the vine languisheth. Verse 8, the mirth of tabrets or timbrels ceases, the noise of them that rejoice endeth, the joy of the heart ceaseth. Look at verse um, 10, the city of confusion or the city without form is broken down. Every house is shut up that no man may come in. Verse 11, crying for wine in the streets, all joy is darkened. The mirth of the land of the earth is gone. And then the verse we just read, in the city is left desolation, and the gate is smitten. These are all just, just telling us the, the grievous nature of Judgment Day, the grievous nature of the time we are presently living in. And and so God says in verse 13, when thus it shall be in the midst of the earth among the people, there shall be as the shaking of an olive tree and as the gleaning grapes when the vintage is done. 
Now, it, the Bible is so complicated and so difficult to understand that we, we would never understand it. We can never learn what God is saying, of course, if he did not help us, if he did not open our understanding and lead us to truth. And the, it's full of statements like this, and when we, we read it initially, and not only initially, we, we could read a verse like this a hundred times, again and again. We read it, and we read it, and we do not understand it. And unless we uh, pray for wisdom and we search the scriptures to see how God uses these words, and what a wonderful blessing it is that God has given us a concordance and other Bible helps to help us find each place words are used elsewhere in the Bible. And, and so we're able to begin to examine how God has used these words and ideas. And, and if he's pleased, he, it still is according to his will. He can open up our eyes to understand what he's saying. Now, concerning the shaking of an olive tree, and the gleaning grapes. Let's turn to Leviticus 19 so we can see how some of these terms are used and, and, uh, and get a better idea of what's in view. Leviticus 19, verse 9. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not wholly reap the corners of thy field, neither shalt thou gather the gleanings of thy harvest. And thou shalt not glean thy vineyard, neither shalt thou gather every grape of thy vineyard. Thou shalt leave them for the poor and stranger. I am Jehovah your God. Here, God is is laying out what he has established in order to take care of the poor, of those that are in need. And this practice of gleaning works this way. Uh, a field owner would plant his crop, and then at the, the right time, he would harvest it. His workers would go into the fields or into the crops and gather the fruit. We have a, a good picture of this with the book of Ruth. When Boaz, who was a rich man, and he owned many fields, had his servants out in the fields reaping. They, they were gathering the fruit. And at the same time, God has commanded that when you gather your, your crop, when you are bringing in the fruit of the land, you are not to go back over. You are not to glean. You are not to go and make sure you've plucked every grape, or you've gathered every olive. You are not to make sure that the field is bare. You are not to do that. But yes, go through your fields, gather your first time through as much of the fruit as you can, and gather the clusters, gather the vines, gather all the large portions of the fruit. But do not send your servants back and 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 pick every single thing. No, you're to leave that. You're to leave a few grapes and a few olives and and whatever for the poor who can follow after you. And maybe that same day, like Ruth, she was a gleaner. She was going through the crops, gleaning after the servants of Boaz. Or maybe the next day or even... A few days later, a stranger might wander by. A poor person who just could not provide would go into the field and try to find everything they could. This was God's plan. It was his system that he had established to provide for everyone so no one would go hungry. And so God is using this type of language in Isaiah 24. Now, it's also found... In Deuteronomy 24, 
beginning in verse 19. When thou cuttest down thine harvest in thy field, and hast forgot a sheaf in the field, thou shalt not go again to fetch it. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow, that Jehovah thy God may bless thee in all the work of thine hands. When thou beatest thine olive tree, thou shalt not go over the bows again. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. Here, the olive tree is mentioned, and it's the same um, same idea, beating thine olive tree, shaking it, uh, causing the olives to fall so you can gather them. You will not go over the bows again. You gather the main fruit, the large majority of the fruit, but you leave some, and here God adds the widow to the poor and the stranger. And also he mentions the fatherless. Then it says in verse 21, When thou gatherest the grapes of thy vineyard, thou shalt not glean it afterward. It shall be for the stranger, for the fatherless, and for the widow. And then he gives the reason in verse 22, And thou shalt remember that thou was a bondman in the land of Egypt, Therefore, I command thee to do this thing. In other words, they were strangers in Egypt, and God took care of them. So, in turn, you are to take care of strangers. Just as believers are strangers in the world, and so we are to to entertain strangers, as it says in the book of Hebrews. And this was done through the sharing of the truth of the gospel where believers spiritually could give someone food or give someone drink and so on. Well, now, let's go to Isaiah 17, which has some similarity to Isaiah 24, but it also has some differences. It says in Isaiah 17, beginning in verse 4, And in that day shall come to pass that the glory of Jacob shall be made thin, and the fatness of his flesh shall wax lean, and shall be as when the harvestman gathereth the corn, and reapeth the ears with his arm. And it shall be as he that gathereth the ears in the valley of Rephium. Yet gleaning grapes shall be left in it, as the shaking of an olive tree, two or three berries in the top of the uppermost bow, four or five in the outmost fruitful branches thereof saith Jehovah, God of Israel. Now here we see the image, we're given a vivid image of what God was saying in the other places we looked at. You leave a a few grapes. You leave some of the berries and some of the olives. You don't uh, get greedy and try to gather everything you can to make as much money or to become as rich as possible. You leave these things. Now, the difference here in Isaiah 17 is that God is speaking. He's telling us that grapes and berries and so forth, just a little, little bit, a handful, have been left. We're not told that in Isaiah 24. It doesn't tell us any fruit is left. It just says, that uh, when thus it shall be in the midst of the earth, that it will be as the gleaning of grapes or the shaking of the olive tree and as the gleaning of grapes. When there's another statement made, let me go back there to make sure I read it right. I'll read verse 13 again. When thus it shall be in the midst of the earth among the people, there shall be as the shaking of, of an olive tree, and as the gleaning grapes when the vintage is done. That's another difference between Isaiah 24 and Isaiah 17. It does not say anything about the vintage being done. And what does that mean when the vintage is done? Well, it means when you are going to gather your crop, you cut down the vines, and the vintage is done. Um, If we go to Judges chapter 7, we're going to see uh, this language used in a very interesting way 
concerning a battle with Gideon and the Midianites. And it says in Judges 7, and I'll begin reading in verse 22. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and Jehovah set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled to Beth Shittah and Zerath, and to the border of Abel, Meholah, unto Tabith. And the men of Israel gathered themselves together out of Nephtali and out of Asher and out of all Manasseh and pursued after the Midianites. And Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters unto Beth Barah and Jordan. And they took two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew Oreb upon the rock Oreb and Zeb. They slew at the winepress of Zeb and pursued Midian and brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon on the other side, Jordan. And in chapter 8, And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus, that thou callest us not? when thou wentest the fight with the Midianites, and they did chide with him sharply. And he said unto them, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison of you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. Now, uh, I, I have to admit, when I've read Judges 8, verse 2 before, I had no idea what it was talking about. But now that we're more carefully going over this kind of language, we can understand it very well. When the Ephraimites are upset with Gideon because he called them late to this battle. In response, Gideon says in verse 2, What have I done now in comparison of you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? Abiezer is a, a family in the tribe of Manasseh. Gideon's father, Joash, was from Abiezer. They were Abiezerites. And so when Gideon gathered that army, which God later dwindled down, and or he, he had Gideon go with 300 men because there were too many. But when Gideon initially gathered the army, he called men from Manasseh and some of the neighboring tribes, but not Ephraim. And that's because he was of the tribe of Manasseh. And yet, Finally, after Gideon and his men had blown the trumpet, after they had broken their pitchers and revealed their lights, and and that created havoc in the enemy camp of the Midianites, so that they fled, and and um, that was the great battle. That was the major battle because they were defeated once they fled. That's what the Ephraimites were upset about. They wanted to be a part of that battle. Now, maybe Gideon didn't call them um, because they were sort of proud, and and I, I don't know why he didn't originally call them, but he didn't. He waited until he thought it necessary that they go to the waters of Beth Barah and Jordan in order to prevent the Midianites from escaping. And when they went there, they were able to gather the two princes of the Midianites, Oreb and Zeb, and they slew them. And that was um, an honorable thing to get two of the leaders, princes, royalty of the enemy. And and uh, Gideon wisely pointed that out to his fellow Israelites, Ephraim, which, by the way, Gideon was of Manasseh. And and Ephraim, both those tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, 
were the tribe of Joseph. They were brothers. They were very closely related as uh, concerning the tribes. And so Gideon makes the statement, the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim compared to the vintage of Abiezer. Yes, they they gathered the the fruit, um, but Ephraim was able to glean after. And it's very interesting that God is using the language of gathering fruit and gleaning and this word vintage concerning judgment. This was a, a judgment of God upon the enemy Midian. And they were gathered, their vintage was done, and the gleaning was actually the killing of the people of the army of the Midianites. Now that helps us to think about this whole idea of gleaning grapes and and so on in a different way. It's not necessarily always the gathering of fruit um, in a spiritual sense related to the elect, but here it can be used to describe destruction and judgment upon the unsaved people. Well, now uh, let's go to another place, and we'll we'll have to go there quickly in Micah chapter seven. Micah seven, and uh, Lord willing, we'll we'll review this in in our next study, just to make sure we understand it correctly. It says in Micah seven, and I'll read the first two verses. Woe is me, for I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits, as the great gleanings of the vintage. Now notice it's it's pronouncing a woe, and yet it's speaking of the great gleanings of the vintage, as we saw in Isaiah twenty four thirteen. It goes on to say there is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the first ripe fruit, the good man is perished out of the earth, and there is none upright among men. They all lie in wait for blood. They hunt every man his brother with a net. Who is the good man? Well, in this context, we would say it's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. There is none good, no, not one among men, but who is good but God only. God only. Christ is eternal God. He is the good man who has perished out of the earth in the sense of when judgment day comes, God will no longer be seeking his lost sheep, but he has abandoned the earth and given them up and over to the judgment. Now, let's go back to verse 1 of Micah 7. They have gathered the summer fruits as the great gleanings of the vintage. And then in further explanation, there is no cluster to eat. Now, a cluster would be something like we find in Numbers 13, when the spies went to search out the land. It says in uh, verse 23, And they came unto the brook of Eshkel, and cut down from thence, a branch with one cluster of grapes, and they bear it between two upon a staff, and they brought of the pomegranates and of the figs. And the place was called the Brook of Eshkel because of the cluster of grapes which the children of Israel cut down from thence, and they returned from searching of the land after forty days. Now this is important. What they say in verse twenty six um And they went and came to Moses and to Aaron and to all the congregation of the children of Israel unto the wilderness of Paran, to Kadesh, and brought back word unto them and said, and unto all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. The cluster of grapes was the fruit of the land of Canaan, the promised land. And what would that fruit be? What is the fruit? of the land of the kingdom of God. 
The Lord Jesus Christ is the fruit. The cluster is representative of Christ. He is typified by this cluster of grapes, which is the fruit of the land of Canaan. And we can know this for sure when we go to Song of Solomon, chapter 1. And we'll have to close shortly. Song of Solomon 1 says in verse 12, While the king sitteth at his table, my spikenard sendeth forth the smell thereof. A bundle of myrrh is my well-beloved unto me. He shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. Now, who's in view? It is referring to the body of Christ, the true believers in the feminine, and Christ himself in the masculine. He is the one referred to that shall lie all night betwixt my breasts. That, that is the beautiful picture of the believers having Christ very uh, comfortably and intimately resting on their breasts as we are typified by a woman. And it says in verse 14, My beloved is unto me as a cluster of camp hire in the vineyards of En Gedi. Here it is calling the beloved, who is the Lord Jesus, the cluster. He is as a cluster of of camp hire. And camp hire, if we search out that word, which you can find uh, in Exodus 30, verse 12, is translated as the word ransom in the verse that speaks of a ransom for his soul. So the, the cluster of ransom, and spiritually it makes sense once We understand the cluster is Jesus, and he's the one who redeemed us. He's the one who paid the ransom for the soul of his people. Now let's go back to Micah 7, and now we understand that the cluster is a type and figure of Christ. And it says again in verse 1, woe is me. For I am as when they have gathered the summer fruits, as the great gleanings of the vintage. There is no cluster to eat. My soul desired the first ripe fruit. Here God is saying, when there is the gleaning of the grapes of the vintage, when the vintage is done, as Isaiah 24, 13 states, there no longer is a cluster to eat. The Lord Jesus is no longer available. You you may seek to enter in, as we read in Luke 13, but not be able. And and this is the the sorrowful information we have to share, but we we must share it because it is what the Bible is teaching in so many places. Well, let's stop here and we'll take a break, a short break, and then we'll come back and open up the room to any questions or comments that anyone may have. 